Hello and welcome. My name is Dan. We are going to look at the animation of Shadow of the Colossus, but first of all, I got something a little special for you guys. So, those of you who watched the Kingdom Hearts episodes may know what's going on here, but for the rest of you, here's what's going on. So, I had an idea. One of the reasons I have for making this little animation analysis series, aside from it just being really fun for me, is to help to explain how animation works. To that end, I thought it might be fun to talk a little bit about just some basic animation fundamentals on this show too, because if you're trying to develop an analytical eye for animation, it really helps to know some of the basics. So, here's what we're gonna do. For the next 12 games that I play on this series, and they are 12 games that I have chosen specifically for this purpose, in the first episode for each game, I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about one of the 12 principles of animation. And hopefully, by the time I have gone through all 12 of them, you guys will have gotten a nice little crash course in Animation 101. And we're gonna start with the first one today, so hopefully this is fun. So, I guess, first off, what are the 12 principles of animation? For those of you who have not heard of them before, what we call the 12 principles of animation were first laid down in a book called The Illusion of Life. It was written by some ex-Disney animators named Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, and they are essentially a collection of techniques that were established by the animators of early Disney feature animation, and they form the foundation for the art of animation as we know it. Like every animator working today, myself included, has spent their career trying to master these basic fundamentals. So today let's talk about the first one, which is timing. So animation is a time-based craft, and that makes timing the most fundamental, foundational principle of the Twelve. It's about measuring change over time. Timing is the speed or the tempo at which an action takes place, and like any action. It could be how long each successive bounce of a rubber ball takes before it slowly comes to rest. It could be the rhythm of a character's steps. It could be the time it takes for an enormous beast to get to its feet. It, really, anything. Like, okay, try applying this to real life right now. If you're sitting at a computer right now, try moving your hand from your mouse to your keyboard as if you were gonna type something, and concentrate on how long that takes to do. Like, how much time passes. So, like, what, does it take maybe a half second? A, se a full second? When you did it, did your hand settle right into the correct position, or did it take like another half second to get your fingers aligned over the correct keys? Okay, here's another one. Now, try looking from your monitor to your mouse, and then back again. How long does it take to look in the new direction? Because that probably went a lot faster than moving your hand, right? Like, maybe just a quarter of a second. In fact, I bet your eyes got there just slightly faster, before your head had completely finished turning to look, because our eyes can move really fast. Alright, here's another one. Try standing up from your chair. How long does it take? See, that probably took like a second, or maybe longer. Maybe two seconds. And it might have even required a few different movements, like first you scoot your chair back, then you lean forward, and then you push yourself up to your feet. And each one of those individual parts of the movement had their own timing as well. So, like, you get the idea. And on a surface level, it's a super simple, obvious rule. Fast things happen quickly, slow things take a longer time, just obviously, right? But this is the foundation upon which all of animation works. And it starts to get more interesting as you start building on it, because you can use timing to communicate all kinds of stuff. Like, for example, size. L let's go back to our earlier example of standing up from a seated position. Let's say it takes a person one second to do that. But what if you wanted to make that person feel like an enormous colossus? To communicate that sense of scale and weight, you could time the action to take much longer, like maybe 5 seconds, or maybe even 10 seconds, depending on how big it is. But this goes beyond even physics. You can even use timing to communicate character and mood. If you speed up the timing of the standing action, you could make the character seem, like, excited or maybe startled. If you slow the timing down, you maybe they feel tired or maybe depressed. See, this is what makes timing so fundamental. It may be simple, but it influences everything. Now, you can think of timing in terms of seconds and half seconds like I've been describing so far, but an animator's gonna find it a lot more useful to think of timing in terms of frames. Frames are our classic unit of measure. For an old-school, traditional hand-drawn animator, a frame essentially meant one drawing. Film runs at 24 frames per second, so assuming they were making a new drawing for every frame, which they didn't always, but let's just assume they did, that's 24 drawings per second. The more frames or drawings an action takes to happen, the longer that action appears to take. 
If an action happens over just a few frames, it's going to appear to be really fast. Now, a lot of you might be used to thinking of counting frames in terms of, like, a game's frame rate, where the number of frames that the game renders per second is variable. It could be 60 frames per second, it could be 30 frames per second, and it might fluctuate at any time between those. What I'm talking about is a different thing, though. For the animator's workflow, we need a way to measure time in constant units. So even though a game's frame rate might fluctuate during play, when we are actually animating characters, the game animator's probably going to do it the same way a film animator would. We're going a little bit long here, but I should probably also bring up spacing. Spacing isn't one of the 12 principles, but it's very closely linked to timing, so I'm just gonna try to go over it real quick. In simplest terms, if timing describes when, spacing describes how. Spacing describes how far something moves or changes from one frame to the next, and the bigger the change in position from one frame to the next, the faster that movement's gonna appear. So say we have a ball, and it's gonna move from one side of the screen to the other side of the screen, and it's gonna take 30 frames to get there. So, okay, we know the timing, 30 frames, but how is it gonna move from point A to point B? Now, it could travel with very even spacing, where it covers the same distance each frame, and it appears to move at a very linear speed. But if the spacing started out much closer together and then got further apart over time, that spacing would make it so that the ball appears to accelerate, starting much slower and then reaching full speed by the end. And we can use the same technique to make it appear to decelerate at the end as well. By altering the amount of change you see from one frame to the next, you can control how fast something appears to happen. So that's basically the idea. And timing and spacing may be pretty straightforward as general concepts, but it can take a lot of practice and experience for an animator to really master the execution of them. Especially when animating more complex stuff, like the human body. Good timing can make all the difference. When timing is great, everything just seems to happen right when it should. Timing is the most important, and in some ways the most difficult, principle to master. So yeah, that is timing. On the next game I play in this animation series, I will talk about the next principle. And then we'll just go on down the list, so hope you guys enjoyed that. Now that we have done that, I think it's time we finally started talking about Shadow of the Colossus. By the way, I'm going to be using a slightly different recording and editing process for these next few games, just to see how it works out and see if it's maybe a little bit more effective. Uh, so if it feels different or weird or if you guys don't like it, let me know and I'll, uh, and I'll keep experimenting. This cutscene is so serene and pretty, I almost feel bad talking during it. There's not even any dialogue to interrupt, but I still feel like I shouldn't say anything. So, the animation of Shadow of the Colossus... First off, I would say that this is a very well-animated game. Not perfect, but very well-animated. Like, the animation of this game is actually really unpolished in a lot of places. Like, my nitpicky side, like, is spotting stuff that I would want to see fixed left and right as I play this. But, the animation in this game gets it right where it matters most, if that makes sense. I'm probably going to complain about a lot of little polishy things as we go in this, but the important stuff, the stuff that really matters for the like for how the game looks and feels, works super well. Man, the score is so pretty. This whole game is so pretty. Oh, I can move the camera around. I never knew you could do that in the menu. That's cool. Okay, here we go. New game. So, in a really broad, general sense, if I had to boil down this game's aesthetic to a single word, you could probably come up with a lot of words, but I would probably settle on majestic, right? Like, whether you're in the middle of one of the really big, bombastic encounters with one of the Colossi, 
or whether you're running around on the horse during one of those lengthy periods of quiet in between the fights, there's always this sense of enormous scale. And in playing this earlier to prepare for this, one of the things that I began to notice is that that plays into all of the animation as well. And not just when it comes to the Colossi, because they are obviously large-scale, huge, enormous creatures. But even with the animation of, of the player character and the horse and pretty much everything, none of the movements in this game are extremely sharp or quick. Like, you won't see any of that fast, snappy, punch-out style animation in this, or any of that super quick Smash Brothers style of animation. Even the small characters in this game don't dart around. Everything is just a little bit softer and slower. Like, watch this. When the main character puts her down and takes this blanket sheet off, it's not slow motion, but it feels like it, the way this cloth dr hangs in the air. It doesn't feel lightweight. It feels like, thanks to the sound effect, it actually feels pretty heavy and big, but it falls very softly. And for a cloth just being thrown and falling to the ground, actually pretty majestic and epic. That's not something that I'd really noticed until coming back and actually paying a lot of close attention to the animation in this, but, uh... Even with this, the way he unsheathes the sword here, it doesn't look like he's pulling it out intentionally super slowly to look like a badass. I mean, he does kind of look that way a little bit, but it mostly just feels like the correct timing for this game. Like that whole majestic aesthetic that this game's animation plays into, it largely does that through timing and through slightly slower timing of everything. Stuff that doesn't feel completely slow motion but does feel a little bit slower and more drawn out. Like, it, this game takes its time, in a lot of ways, both in a macro and in a micro sense, in all of the animations. We're gonna go a little bit longer on this episode because of the lengthy animation talk stuff at the beginning, so, uh... So, in going back and kind of watching a lot of my animation videos up until this point, one thing I've noticed in my own analysis of these games is that I've tended to be very forgiving, <laughs> I guess, is, I don't know if that's the best word, but I've tended to be very easy on a lot of these games in judging their animation. And, I mean, I'm not wanting this to turn into the nitpick show, for one thing. Like, I want to be celebrating where games are doing well, and I want to highlight for you guys, like, when a game is doing something well, I want to try to explain why that's working to you guys. And we also just happen to have been talking about several games with great animation, so that's also kind of why it's been very positive overall. And I think the other reason that I've been doing that is because since I've been working in games for a couple of years now, I know all of the complications that come up in game animation, and I know how hard it is to make a game animation that looks as great as what you would see in a film. So having gone through some of that myself, I feel very forgiving <laughs> to, any, to any other game animators out there and the work that they've created. At this point, I'm astounded when any game comes out great, period, because, <laughs> because when you're actually going through the process yourself trying to make something, making games is really hard. <laughs> Making great games is super hard, and it, and yeah, when you're actually in the middle of it, trying to figure out, like, wrestle with all these little problems and try to figure out how to make this game feel good and, and play well and be fun and be enjoyable, and you see the staggering amount of work before you, it, and then you look at some other studio come out with a great game, and you're just like, how did they do that? <laughs> how did they figure out? How did they figure out how to do that? Anyway, all that to say, that's probably why I've been very forgiving on a lot of these games. I'm going to try to start being a little bit more... Not harsh on them, but like I'm going to try to start being a little bit more critical of stuff that doesn't work, just so I can use them as useful lessons and stuff to help you guys spot stuff that's not working as well. But, but yeah, I, I'm not going to try to get too negative about it, but I do want to at least acknowledge where things could be better. Just because, like, that's useful. That's important for learning. So, yeah, so I'm gonna try to do that. It's not all amusement. A little click, 
if it leads to Izzo. I'm going to talk about this more later, but one of the most important elements for making this game feel as large and cinematic and epic as it does is the camera. Just pay attention to that as we go through all these episodes. I'm going to talk about it more in depth later, but the effect of the camera in this game cannot be overstated. I'll bet. I always give the call. No thousand kids, no quarrels. All those rooms around I were confused. Ayo was not the Iwako. Like, okay, let's go into nitpick mode just for a little while here, while we've got just this cutscene going on. If I were to get really nitpicky here, like if I were to judge this like I would film animation, where polish is king, these are the sorts of things that I would pick out. First off, I think it's good that he is largely still throughout this, because he's listening to a voice, he's trying to stand resolute and determined and put on a brave face, and he is determined here. He is, this is not a character who is afraid of what's going on. He has a purpose. But there's a very fine line between stillness and being overly stoic and not conveying quite enough emotion. If I were treating this like a film, I would want to see more... I would want to see more subtle acting performance, mostly in the eyes. Like, again, I'm fine with him being still and stoic and mostly listening here. You're not going to do quite as much movement usually when you're listening to another character speak. But I would want to see subtle reactions to different things that this voice was telling him. I would want to see maybe some brief little moments of... It could be self-doubt. It really would depend on how you wanted the character to act or perform from moment to moment here. And there are any number of different ways that you could have a character perform one scene. Like, every animator will perform, quote-unquote, this scene a little bit differently, but I would want to see some more subtle performance in the eyes. We don't get a very good close look at his face, but he feels a little bit too still here. I'd want to see just a little bit more acting from him, I think. Like, you'd want to see subtle reactions in his face to what the voice tells him. Reactions that I'm not really seeing in this. Another nitpick I would have is just with his, like his body's pose is pretty good. Feet planted, bravely facing this strange voice head on. His hand and finger pose though is less great. And I suspect it might be just a very simple hand and fingers rig that they're working with here on this character. So we're not seeing a lot of really intricate, detailed finger animation, but that just sort of not quite open, not quite closed fist shape he's got going on here with the clawed fingers is not super appealing as hand and finger poses go. It feels like a half measure between the clenched fist and a more relaxed hand pose. It's kind of in no man's land right now. It's that just that's not a very appealing hand pose is what I'm saying. See, this is the kind of nitpicky stuff that can go a long way when it's done right, but it's not ultimately the thing that's going to make this work or not work. Like, you still, you get the idea from what's here. He is listening, he is not afraid, he is here with purpose, and he is determined to achieve his goal, and we can already pretty clearly see what his goal is. That's the important thing. Some of the simplicity in his facial animation might also be simplicity in his facial rig as well. They may just not be able to do very subtle expression stuff. Because, frankly, you're not going to be close to this character's face for 99.5% of this game. So his face just may not be built for intricate facial performance. This was a game on the PS2. 
and it is technically very impressive in a lot of other ways, so. Yes, by the way, I'm playing on the PS3 HD re-release version of this game again, but for most games, when you get an HD re-release, their animation is often unchanged, at least with 3D games. So that's why I've just gone ahead and used the HD versions of these. You, I would do anything. All right, so now we're in control. Now we're moving. Okay, here's my big nitpick. I think probably the thing I <laughs> probably the thing I like least about the animation in this game is the main character's run cycle. <laughs> the main character's run cycle in any game is one of the most important animations in it because it is the animation you are going to see most. You are probably going to be looking at this animation for hours. And that means that it is super important that you make something that looks good. Or at least feels good. And this run cycle does not feel good, <laughs> in my opinion. Like, let, let's look at what's going on here. For, for whatever reason, in Fumito Ueda's games, his protagonists always run and move around in this really floppy kind of way. And I understand that that's probably a stylistic choice, and I'm kind of okay with that in theory, because it makes them feel, it makes these characters feel and move in a kind of unique way. It's it's almost like a, it's almost like a signature. But this run cycle in particular, I am not a fan of. It's just a little bit too floppy. And a large part of the problem I have is with the legs. If we go really slow here, looking at the leg animation, the animation of the legs and feet is quite strange and a little bit glitchy looking. And I can't tell if that's their inverse kinematic system working against them, and I'll explain that in more detail later for those of you who don't know, but look at how with each time, each time he brings his foot forward with a step, his foot crosses over his other foot, his knee comes up, and then it snaps straight, like very straight for a couple, for like three full frames until he lands and hits. And then the next one snaps straight, and it's like he's, it's almost like this weird frolicky look where he's, pointing his foot weirdly forward with each step. That is not how people look when they run. And his ankle joint also does kind of a weird rotational thing with each step where it points directly forward to where his foot's about to land and then kind of points upward like feet normally do when they're about to land heel first on the ground. The legs are doing some weird stuff with every step. And the arms are also doing a little bit of floppiness and the sword's movement really emphasizes that. Like, look how much the sword kind of flops behind the character as they run forward. And he's got one hand on his scabbard's hilt, which is, as an acting choice, I think actually not a bad idea because it kind of feels natural. You'll That scabbard is likely to dangle and flop around a lot as you run, so it would make sense as you're running to kind of hold it steady so it doesn't flop around everywhere. If I asked somebody for a run animation for a character in my game, and this is what they came back with, I would have some notes for them. <laughs> is my largest point. This is probably the most negative I'm gonna get on anything in this game, because largely I'm actually super impressed with the animation in this game, especially on a technical level, and I'm gonna get more into that later, but this is probably the biggest red mark I'm seeing. And as an animator, I am probably gonna be way more critical about this sort of thing than your average person or player would, and that's fine. All right, so that was a whole lot of negative. Now let's talk about something very positive. The horse animation in this game and the horse riding animation is some of the best I've seen in a game, period. There are a lot of games that have horse riding in them. There are a few of them that have good looking horse riding in them. Off the top of my head, uh, Red Dead Redemption looks great, I, I think. I, I guess I have to look at it again, but I'm pretty sure everything I remember about Red Dead Redemption's horse riding looks great. Metal Gear Solid 5's horse riding is pretty darn good. Uh, let's see what else. The Witcher 3's horse riding is okay. The horse riding in this is pretty phenomenal, especially considering this was a PlayStation 2 game. The fact that this was a PlayStation 2 game is going to come up a lot as I talk about yeah. this, because there are some really impressive technical achievements in this game that I am... Still very impressed they managed to pull off on PlayStation 2 hardware. 
Like, the little nitpicky stuff that I'm pointing out about the run, and the weird popping in the legs and all that stuff, that's polished stuff. That's minor stuff that I would absolutely not let fly in film animation. In game animation, I prefer not see it either, but it is so minor compared to the things that this game does well, like the horse riding. Like, look at this. First of all, the animation on the horse itself is fantastic. Horses can actually be pretty tricky to animate. They're kind of a weird animal, just physiologically. They're very big and heavy and muscular with spindly little legs. And they're powerful and they can move really fast on those spindly little legs. And the way they move and run, like their gait and the way their like front and back legs work together and their chest and rear and their head and how all of that works together in maintaining balance. Horse animation can be pretty complicated, especially all the more complicated. In fact, way more complicated when you factor in a rider that is giving them direction and steering them around. Like, okay, before I even get into that complexity, just look at the animation on the tail and mane yeah. in this. Like, some of this, I think, might be done dynamically a little bit. Like, there might be some very, very basic physics contributing to it, but the way the tail and mane bounce, the way they react to direction changes, like, it's very rough. It's a very, it's actually a very simple geometric shape with a texture that's flapping around, but the movement of it looks so perfectly right that it feels amazing in practice, even though it is actually a pretty low-res assets that you're looking at. Look at that. That looks fantastic. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm kind of transfixed by it, just looking at how right that feels. And the way the horse's head kind of pumps forward as it runs, and the way that its head turns as Wander gives it new direction and kind of steers it to the right or the left. As her, steers her to the right or the left. She has a name. <laughs> it's Agro. <laughs> What's even more impressive is that the animation of Wander, the main character riding the horse, also looks fantastic, and it feels like he is riding this horse. It doesn't feel like he's just kind of locked or glued onto the top of this horse, and like its motion isn't affecting his at all. Each step and jump and all the different movements the horse makes feel like they impact him as well. Like the way Wander's body bounces and curves as they run, and the way he pulls his reins holding arm way out to the side to steer Agro in a different direction. The way his sword arm bounces as they run. The way he leans way back when he pulls back on the reins to, to like, to slow Agro down. That is all super impressive. And it gets even more impressive when you start factoring in more of the dynamic stuff that they do. Like, here, let me show you. The way Agro's animation and rig are built, she can handle standing on really uneven terrain so that her front part of her body will be properly standing in at the correct height over the ground the front part of her body is on, and the back half will be standing properly and correctly on the back half. And shes you can tell that it's not just the default horse animation playing here, because her neck is pulled and leaned back to account for the balance of standing on this uneven ground. And what's even more impressive, the main character, while they're standing on this heavy slope, is leaning backward to counterbalance, like an actual horse rider would. Because if they didn't lean back, they would risk losing balance and falling forward over the horse's head and onto the ground. Like, that's an impressive attention to detail, but it's also a really important element to factor in when trying to make a horse rider feel natural and correct. Because a horse rider has to manage to stay on the horse, they've got to guide the horse, they've got to for animation purposes, feel like they're being influenced by the horse's movements, like the bounce up and down as they run, and the uh, inertia as the horse turns in new directions, or speeds up or slows down. But the rider also has to lean to factor in inertia and gravity in order to stay on the horse. And Wander does in this, and that's a dynamic system. That's not just all pre-made, pre-baked animation, like, that's something that the PS2 has to calculate. That is one of the many technical things I am impressed by in this game. 
Okay, this has already gone on way long, and I apologize. When I come back next time, we are going to talk more about this game, and we are going to fight the first Colossus, because there is a whole lot to talk about and unpack there. So, see you guys next time. Thank you.